live from kids in the house today we're going to talk about sleep how to get your baby to sleep one of the most searched topics on the internet uh, I'm here with Jill Campbell clinical psychologist who works at the pump station where I went to get help to get my three kids to sleep uh, how are you today Jill so good to have you and so Jill when should a baby be able to sleep through the night right, that's a question a lot of parents want to know it's not a simple answer. It depends on baby's temperament and personality. Depends on um, what you what you mean by sleeping through the night. But as a general guideline, I'd say probably between four to six months, maybe closer to six months. It always seems like everybody else's baby sleeps through the night right away. And yes. you're, you always have the baby never sleeps. Right? Always the mom oh, in the yeah. class next to you or yeah. your best friend's yeah. baby sleeping through it. Yeah. You know, like three weeks, weeks, yeah, my baby's <laughs> sleeping tonight. Never happened to me. Okay, so we're going to bring two more incredible sleep experts on board. Uh, one is in London and one is in Ohio. So we're having a very international sleep uh, advice here. So we, we are going to have Heidi Holovlet. She's a mother of two, professional baby sleep consultant certified breastfeeding counselor and award-winning author and founder of baby sleep advice and she's joining us from london and from ohio we have nicole johnson and she is the founder of the baby sleep site how are you guys i'm fine thank Good you for having us i'm so honored to have you here from so far away uh, thank you for having me i'm actually going to start by rolling a clip from our website from kim west and then I, I like to have all of you guys' thought on it. And, uh, you know, start out with a conversation about your guys' different sleep philosophies. So here we go. Kim West. There's basically four different types of sleep training methods. I know there's a lot of books out there, but behaviorally, sci behavioral science-wise, there's only four. So the first one is extinction, meaning put the baby in awake and don't go in all night long. The other one is called gradual extinction. So you go in and you check on them in timed increments, 5, 10, 15 minute increments. The other method is fading, which is the one I tend to recommend, where you stay with your child offering physical and verbal reassurance to help them go to sleep and then you slowly move out. And then the last one is doing nothing, which believe it or not is a method because making no decision is still a decision <laughs> and it's still something you do and then you know I find those parents hope that their child will naturally outgrow the problem which usually it doesn't work that way um, but sometimes it can so those are the four most common sleep training methods that was Kim West she has a lot of great videos on our site so Nicole do you agree with this Oh, for the most part, I do. Uh, however, I don't think it's very cut and dry. I think that there's a lot of in between. And we also have some parents who wish to continue bed sharing, so they'll never really move out per se. And so I think it kind of depends on the baby. Also, I can use a combination of methods. I might start with a very hands-on method. And as my baby gains confidence and abilities, I can give them more space to do so independently. And Heidi, what do you think? I have to say I agree for the most part as well. Um, my own philosophy is closest to uh, the three, so the fading method that Kim is talking about. Um, so I'm most of all about gently helping a baby to sleep, really allowing him or her the time to develop the sleeping skills that, that she needs and that will stay with her for the rest of her life. That Seems great. Jill, is, uh, seems like most people are moving towards that. Is, are people still doing the cry it out method? Well, I think, you know, it depends what you mean when you say cry it out. So I think that total extinction, which was that method one, is rarely used anymore. 
Um, but it so depends on, again, the baby's temperament and the parents as well and what they feel comfortable with. So it's always about what are their goals, what do they need, how much sleep are they getting, um, and what feels like a method where we're also considering uh, what our baby needs and how we respond to our baby. Good thoughts. Um, I'm going to now get some parents on board to ask you some real questions. So a couple of nights she started waking up like one hour after I put her down, screaming, being like scared of something. And I was wondering if it's like a nightmare or I've read several things about um, terror nights or something like that, because she just started. So Jill, is that, that's not night terror, is it? Probably not. Um, my, again, we'd have to interview and ask her a lot of questions, but my gut would be, how is she putting her baby down? So if she's putting her baby down to sleep in her arms and then transferring her once she's in deep sleep, about 60 minutes is the time of a normal sleep cycle for a baby. So it could be the baby then has this brief awakening, which all human beings have, and all of a sudden the baby's in a totally different environment. And so she's startled and she screams and she's upset because it's like her whole world has just changed on her. That very interesting, I guess. That's a, well, that seems very logical. Uh, and uh, we're getting a, web, a question from our website here. Um, Heidi, is it true? that a baby will wake up early if you put them to bed late and wake up late if you put them to sleep early? So the basic principle of this idea is that in order for a baby to be able to go to sleep properly, spend a good night and sleep late, um, she needs to go down to sleep uh, quietly, peacefully, meaning she may not be overtired. So that's the principle of this and um, it certainly works. On the other hand, that doesn't mean it is a magical solution for every baby who wakes up early in the morning. So there may be other things going on, simple things like external, some noise at the neighbor's house or a simple problem with self-soothing, that sort of thing. So it is not a magical solution, but it is an important thing to, to watch out for overtiredness and therefore look after, or always look for an early bedtime. So, if the, but if the baby's overtired, it's a bigger chance that they're going to wake up early. Yes, because um, being overtired is um, a state of, uh, you could say, arousal, over arousal, uh, meaning she is not able to uh, settle well. And that means she has a, not a restful, peaceful start of the night. And that also leads to a more uh, easily interrupted night sleep. And um, on the whole, uh, a poor sleep, which also means she will likely wake up sooner than she, she might if she had gone to sleep um, nicely tired before overtired. I hope that was helpful for our mom out there. And uh, we're going to put another mom on. Hi, so my son Beckett is 15 and a half months old and I'm wondering when and how do we transition from two naps a day to one nap a day? Um, he's kind of all over the place right now. And when we have one nap in the day, he's not quite making it to dinner time um, without meltdowns. I'm just confused as to how we, how we transition from two naps a day to one nap a day and when the right time to do that is. So Nicole, when do you go from one, from two to one? <laughs> right. The average age is 15 to 18 months old, although we see a lot of 13 to 14 month olds do it as well. It can be a very rough transition for some. It usually takes a good one to two weeks at least to fully transition to one nap. We generally start moving the, the morning nap later in 15 to 30 minute increments. And your schedule should be such that your baby is napping about five hours after they wake up for the day. They take a two now hour nap at least, and then they go to bed about five hours after they wake up from their nap. Also during the transition, it's best to have one to two times a week that you offer two naps just to curb overtiredness. But in general, at first, babies will struggle to get to their bedtime, uh, but you want to also move bedtime a bit earlier to stop the overtiredness cycle that uh, we've been talking about. Well, I like that to do it 
to the first week. I never heard that. It's a good wish I knew that before. Yes. <laughs> uh, I have one from the, the website. Um, my baby always falls asleep at the breast, which makes it really hard for my husband to put him to sleep. What's your well, advice? Well, if a baby always falls asleep the same way, it does make it harder because babies sleep association is to fall asleep nursing and being held by mom. So trying to have dad take over and maybe do another um, soothing mechanism, use another association, so maybe holding and bouncing and um, having baby sometimes fall asleep maybe in the stroller at first. So working toward using other methods so that baby sees that it can fall asleep, not just with the breast and the nursing. So using different techniques to soothing so they, don't get... so that they have different sleep associations. Also maybe having some white noise or swaddle, something that can be with them with any method that I they're love using it. as I love they get it. older. I yes. love it. If I might add something, I yes, have Nicole. something to add for that. If you're trying to include your spouse or the father you know, into the routine, you can also introduce one or two steps after breastfeeding that he can partake in. Or you can even gradually start with having him start the bedtime routine and then you breastfeed and then you can start to add a step over time. So it might be over the course of a week, but you can slowly infuse him into the routine as well. That's a great idea. And again, uh, it depends on how old your baby is too, on you know how much you can have in between the breastfeeding and putting baby down. As they get older, they can handle more of an activity in between the two. Yeah, it's so tempting to let them fall asleep once they're at the breast though. I am now gonna roll a clip from one of the leading experts in the world on bed sharing and co-sleeping, uh, James McKenna. Um, he has some great videos on our site and um, we put together a little clip. There are experts on co-sleeping and sudden infant death with many years of research behind them who disagree with that American Academy of Pediatrics statement. In fact, one of them, James McKenna, was on the committee when they made the decision and strongly disagrees that when bed sharing is done in a safe way that it can be done to the benefit of babies. An example of unsafe co-sleeping that you might not even think about is a dad sitting in a recliner chair, baby on his chest, they both doze off. Baby can slip between the father and the side of that chair and very tragic consequences can be the result. The breastfeeding mother is in a particularly good position to detect changes in its baby's physiology and needs that the baby might have if she is indeed bed sharing. One of the physiological differences is that both the mother and the baby um, move toward greater sensitivities to the presence of the other and respond to each other in kind. We learned that over 60% of mother's brief awakenings occur plus or minus two seconds after the baby has aroused. And similarly, we learned that about 40% of the baby's arousals have occurred plus or minus two seconds after the mother is aroused. This reflects the fact that the mother is not what we call habituating to the presence of her baby, that is, becoming so used to it that she's not protective of that baby. In fact, it's the opposite. She becomes increasingly able to, to respond to changes in that baby's physiology. Aside from that, of course, the baby is spending more time in light stages of sleep, which is protective against SIDS because it prevents the baby from getting into deep sleep from which it might be more difficult for that baby to arouse, to defend its airway passages, et cetera, following an apnea or a breathing pause. And similarly, as regards to breastfeeding itself, the comparisons we've made between the bed sharing breastfeeding situation and the solitary sleeping breastfeeding situation is that the baby breastfeeds twice as much. This helps mother's milk supply. It permits, in a sense, mother to manage her own breastfeeding with more ease and convenience, in addition to the fact that it simply gives the baby, you know, more volume of milk that contributes to its growth and well-being. So James McKenna has spent, I think, 30 years studying moms and babies in his sleep lab and wrote some great books. So I'd like to hear from, what, what are your thoughts about it? Do you think it's okay to co-sleep? So, uh, 
Heidi, do you want to start? Yes, I'm happy to start. I have to say that um, Dr. McKenna is, uh, to me, um, the master for everything related to co-sleeping and breastfeeding. Uh, so I cannot uh, disagree with him. I mean, he, um, the things he just said, um, I completely agree with. So yes, I am for co-sleeping. For parents who do so safely, first and foremost, and who do it willingly and who are happy to do it. Because there are also parents who feel, um, who do not want to co-sleep at all, but who feel themselves ending up doing it just to get any sleep at all. And then you get into an area that is um, it's uncomfortable for either parent or for both parents. And that's when you need to try and transition away from the co-sleeping. But as long as both parents are happy to do it and are absolutely safe about it, yes, why not? Very good answer, I think. And Nicole, what, what, what do you th what's your thoughts? Well, in general, we try not to say there's a right or wrong place to sleep as long as it's done safely. And I would agree that if everybody's happy with the co-sleeping or the bed sharing, then in general, you know, we support that, obviously. I do think that parents need to have proper expectations. If you're breastfeeding, then you probably will feed your baby longer at night while you're bed sharing. Bed sharing happened to not work for me, so I definitely agree with Dr. McKenna that I was more in tune with my baby. I would wake very frequently, but unfortunately, I couldn't go right back to sleep. So expectation-wise, I was waking up to nurse every one to two hours, and that's just not you know, um, doable very long for very many families, depending on the situation. So we did move away from co-sleeping uh, fairly early, around four or five months, but I went on to breastfeed for a full year. So I think either can work. Uh, I, I would never tell a family not to co-sleep as long as it's safely done, uh, but I also try to help those who are ready for their baby to sleep in another space as well. So Jill, what's your thoughts? So uh, I just wanted to clarify the difference between bed sharing and co-sleeping, because we've mentioned sort of both terms. Um, so all uh, bed sharing is co-sleeping, but not all co-sleeping is bed sharing. So co-sleeping means babies in the same room with you, usually within arm's reach. But bed sharing means babies in the bed with you. And so just to clarify the difference, American Academy of Pediatrics recommends co-sleeping, arms reach, not bed sharing for at least the first six months. But reality is it, a lot of parents really do benefit from bed sharing, many of the things James McKenna said. And it really, I agree with everyone else, it really depends on the parent, on the mom, how much sleep is she getting, what's working for her. If a mom is exhausted and bed sharing helps and she's doing it safely, I think it's wonderful. Um, it can be the other way around, as Nicole experienced, that the baby wakes up and mom's not getting any sleep. So it's working with the parent and uh, making sure you're doing it safely and knowing the difference. Academy uh, recommends that you keep the baby in the room for the first six months because that uh, will take down the risk of SIDS, right? Yes, um, studies do show that when babies in the same room, um, which could either be co-sleeping or bed sharing, that the risk of SIDS is greatly reduced. Um, probably some of the reasons are you're, you're more aware of your baby and checking on your baby more often. Also, baby does tend to wake up more often when baby's in the same room with you. They hear you, they smell you, and some of the beliefs, we don't really understand fully what causes SIDS, but some of the belief is um, as James McKenna mentioned, if a baby's in a lighter stage of sleep and they wake up and they see you, um, that that actually waking up might help prevent the risk of SIDS, especially for an uh, immature you know, brain in the first few months of life. And we all agree that there is no right way. Everyone has to figure out what is right for them. Definitely, um, yes. I myself co-slept for a long time with two kids. Uh, and with the other one, I was uh, went up. So whatever works, you have to find the, w the way it works for you the best. Uh, with that, we're going to hear from another parent. What is the trick okay. now that Rowan is nine months to get him to not wake up at five in the morning? <laughs> what does this mom, poor mom do? I, five in the morning. The number one reason for waking up at 5 a.m. is usually being overtired at bedtime as well as waking up the hour after bedtime from the other parent. 
so usually it's a schedule problem one way or the other. So at nine months, it could be that they still have three naps and therefore Rowan doesn't need to sleep as much at night. And so he's waking up ready to go at 5 a.m. Or alternatively, he just recently transitioned to two naps and he's way overtired by bedtime. He's staying awake too long. More, th more than likely, he's waking up too early the next day, um, for, you know, too early for the day. Uh, anybody have anything to add or should we help another parent? I could add just one yeah. more thing is I agree with everything that Nicole said, but sometimes too, if um, a baby's waking up at five and mom is feeding the baby right at five, then baby gets used to eating at five o'clock and so their uh, hunger clock is set for five. So if she starts in just small increments, maybe 10, 15 minutes, holding off feeding the baby in the morning um, and working toward maybe 6 a.m., that often baby will start to sleep later when their hunger cues are for later in the day. Well, I hope that was helpful for this poor mom who wakes up at five. Uh, we're gonna uh, hear from one other mom. My question is, um, my son has just started to crawl and get really busy in the crib, and I find it increasingly hard to get him down to sleep. Um, and he likes to wake up in the middle of the night and practice his crawling. So how do I get him to sleep through the night but not um, discourage his newfound abilities? Heidi, how do we help this mom with a crawling baby? <laughs> um... First of all, my very first uh, concern would be uh, safety. So as soon as a baby starts to be very active, moving in the crib, your first um, task as a parent will be uh, to make sure that he cannot crawl out, fall out, get stuck. So that will be the first thing, because whatever you do, the, working towards him self-soothing and not crawling out of the crib, he will still try and practice his crawling. Um, so just make sure he is safe and cannot escape or get himself into a difficult or dangerous situation. Uh, next you will, or the mom will, need to work on uh, self-soothing, making sure that the crib is a place to sleep. When the baby wakes up, he happily uh, self-soothes back to sleep again. This can be with a transition during which she will help him to do that before he starts um, practicing his crawling in the middle of the night because that will excite him waking up and disrupt his sleep patterns. The right. other thing I would say, the third thing uh, to do is help him practice a lot during the day. Not so much that he gets tired, that's not the whole point, but more that he gets a chance to really practice and to show off his new skills, uh, that sort of thing, to really um, encourage that and be happy about him showing his skills during the day. And um, it is true too, I think, that the more uh, till floor time that a baby spends, it helps their intelligence. Floor time is very important, right? Yes. Um, can, can also, well, babies need to have time to explore their world. They need to have time to um, practice. So. Floor time enables them to do that. It enables them to, um, you know, develop and not always, you know, if babies being carried around all day long, they're going to be uh, more likely to practice during the night because they will find a way. Developmentally, that's where they're at. And at nine months, there's a huge burst of development, especially with gross motor skill development. I would disagree just slightly in that I would say if the baby starts to practice during the night, if he's not crying, uh, not to go in, to actually just give him the message, it's nighttime, it's sleep time, he might practice, but a lot of times they'll practice, you'll hear them on the monitor, but they're not crying and then they will go back to sleep. If we interrupt that process, we might actually, for a nine month old baby, cause and effect wise, we might actually teach that baby, oh, we will come in at, you know, in the middle of the night and uh, soothe you and be there with you. So of course if baby's upset and crying that's a different story But if baby's just kind of crawling and go, you know googling and practicing let it be it will pass. It is a phase Great advice. Yeah, so that's indeed a good point Jill. I, I totally agree with that I I would go in as you say when she starts getting upset and uh, or could be in danger if the crib is not completely safe but indeed if 
he or she is happy, just babbling, practicing, and then goes back to sleep. Perfect. And with that, I'd like to uh, remind our audience that you can go to kids in the house forward slash live TV and type in your questions for expert and get help right now. And I'm going to go to the questions we're actually being typed in right now. Um, what kind of environment should the baby be sleeping in? Some people say you should keep it noisy so the baby gets used to it. And some people say you should make it dark and quiet and use a sleep machine. Nicole, what do you think? <laughs> I think, again, it depends on the baby. Some babies are very light sleepers. And no matter how much you practice, I'll say that, practice, uh, they will never learn to sleep through loud noises. Whereas some babies like the murmur, kind of like their own white noise of people talking like at the grocery store. I also think it depends on the age because a newborn may be able to sleep through a lot, but as they become more social and aware of their world, they're not going to necessarily uh, want to stay asleep when there's a party going on basically for them. So that's that's one thing I would definitely um, keep in mind there. So I hope that was helpful for you. So Jill, we have another question from the side here. Uh, what if my baby misses a nap? Should I force them to sleep or just skip the nap? It's kind of hard to force a baby to sleep. You can certainly, um, if they miss a nap, you can certainly try to set up an environment and give them a little space um, and you know try to get them to you know, sleep associations have that nap, but um, if they don't sleep, they don't sleep, and you might just have to move the bedtime up that night and take it from there and start again the next day. You know, I just I hate like what comes to me from that question is just like that pressure that parents feel like, uh oh, we missed a nap. Now we have to force this. We have to stay on schedule all the time. I mean, schedules can really be helpful, but you know, babies are human, and so sometimes they're going to miss a nap. But you should then put them to bed earlier. Probably if they skip a nap, they're going to be more likely to get overtired. So you would think in those terms, and probably an earlier bedtime would be called for that night. Guys, if you like this program, uh, Please go to Kids in the House and sign up for a premium subscription. Parenting is not easy, and you could always use the extra help. Kids in the House has over 500 best-selling authors, doctors, and experts, all at the touch of your fingertips, providing the answers and insight when you need it. With over 9,000 videos, if you've got a question, Kids in the House has got the answer. Get instant access today to the premium content parents need. Oh yeah, we shine like stars. Be a parenting superstar today by subscribing to our premium content. Oh yeah, we shine. Inspire, educate, entertain. Stars like stars. Kids in the house. So Heidi, um. At what age do you think that you should start putting your baby on a schedule? Ah, that's a good question. Um, it also depends what you mean by schedule. If you're talking about a time schedule or are you talking about a regular routine of, say, eat, play, sleep, um, that sort of thing. Because the, Yeah, the like where, where do you move from, you know, uh, feeding on demand or just following the baby schedule to kind of nudging them into following your schedule? Um, I think that would say that would happen uh, for most parents and babies uh, between four and six months old. That is also when babies um, ready develop developmentally to move towards a more regular and a more timed, almost uh, fixed timed uh, schedule. And Jill, when do you stop swaddling okay so again it depends on every baby i know we're saying that a lot but in general uh, babies have a lot of reflexes the first three months of life so harvey carp talks about that being the fourth trimester because um, babies aren't yet really ready to be here once they move out of that they uh, margaret Mahler, a theorist says they kind of hatch and they have a lot more control over their bodies 
And so usually that's the time where they no longer really need to be swaddled. Um, so you would look for during the day, them being able to self-soothe, bring their hands to their mouth, not having as much of the startle reflex. And to me, that would be a good time um, as a guideline. But of course, you would look at how your baby's sleeping and also rolling over. If they're rolling over, um, when you put them on their back, it's harder to roll over in a swaddle, but babies do do it. And if they start to do that, then for safety reasons, you need to unswaddle. And Nicole, at what point do you move them from the uh, crib to a bed? Well, we try not to move them to a regular bed until three to four years on average, and some of our sleep consultants have waited till five. Uh, I, I would say minimum age is two years old, uh, unless you're doing a Montessori style bed. Some people will start with a bed even as young as eight months old, but uh, for some personality types that can be challenging. I would say at two years old, we start to see a shift where even if your toddler never needed you in the room to fall asleep before, they do, so it's kind of a rough time to also go to a bed. It's a big change, uh, but I would say three to four years out on average. Okay, now we're gonna roll a really fun clip of uh, what happens when moms are sleep deprived. I was so exhausted when he was maybe like two or three months, I put the keys to the car in the refrigerator. I'm looking everywhere. I was so tired. I was feeding him in my dream. I like I had him on the boob and everything. And my husband had to be like, like, honey, like wake up, you need to feed the baby. And I completely thought I already was because I was doing it in my dream. When I would manage to get dressed, um, my clothes would sometimes be in and out or backwards tags and people would point it out to me. Oops. I was putting, instead of putting, uh, I used like some uh, cream for my face. Instead of using the, fa the, the cream, I used toothpaste, like those type of things, like as the other end, as a hairspray, things like, it was all over the place. Call over my mother-in-law and my, my mom and just give the baby to them <laughs> and say I need a nap. So one morning that I had an appointment, I blow dry my hair very early. And I realized that she would continue to sleep like as long as the blow dryer was on. So for one week, I just needed to sleep. So I would just like have it by myself. I mean, not the baby, like the blow dryer and just like turn it on so her like she could sleep a little bit longer. Well, I remember myself go walking out the house with two different pair of shoes. And I also remember putting my purse on the car and driving off. But on a more serious note, Jill, uh, do you think that there is a correlation between mothers being exhausted and sleep deprived and postpartum? And when oh, do you feel like, with your moms, when do you kind of draw the limits? When you say, hey, I, you know, this is getting not safe. I definitely believe there's a correlation between sleep deprivation and postpartum depression. I don't think it's the only factor, um, hormonal factors. Um, you know, there's the family history, there's so much, but when you're sleep deprived, you're more likely to have memory issues, you're more likely to have mood swings, serotonin is replenished in deep sleep, so when you're not getting, you know, any serotonin, um, deep sleep, you're not getting enough serotonin in your body, and so it's so important, like one mom joked about it, but um, hand the baby off, any kind of support you can have, build your community, because we need to sleep and we're gonna be the best parents, um, the most centered, the most patient, and um, the happiest when we're getting some sleep ourselves. Great, great advice. Um, I'm seeing another question here from the site. Uh, that is actually good. Um, Heidi, I'm gonna let you take this one. My mother-in-law tells me to feed my baby like crazy before I put him to sleep. Is it okay for me to top off with formula to get him to sleep longer? In my view, absolutely not, because uh, overfeeding before bedtime is, um, to me, unsafe and leads to restless sleep. It can also um, uh, mess with your uh, breast milk supply, right? Oh, yes, of course, yeah. Yeah, 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 because as soon as you give anything extra to breastfeeding, as long as you're exclusively breastfeeding, that is of course important. Uh, as soon as, as you give something else, something extra, your own milk production will start decreasing. 
Okay, we're gonna roll another funny clip. Here we go. So Nicole, um, this is so funny because it's so typical. Is this, uh, is this a good idea? <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> in general not. Um, I, I definitely understand the army crawl out of the room when you're trying to sneak away, but we try to encourage our children to have the confidence that they can do this on their own. So rather than sneak out, it's definitely better for you to, first you might have the baby fall asleep on their own without you patting their back or anything like that. And then, uh, and then you can work on leaving the room before they're asleep. When I uh, had my second baby, I had a lact lactation person co come over to my house and show me how to safely nap with my baby. And it changed my life. It's my favorite sleep tip. So we're gonna roll a clip. This is what is known as a side lie position. And this is excellent for moms who would like to get a, a nap and rest with their baby. To do the side lie, you, the mom simply lies on her side, as you can see this mom is doing. Put a pillow or two underneath your head and shoulders, whatever is comfortable for you. Your bottom arm is kind of pulled up out of the way. You can tuck a pillow behind your back if that helps you to be more comfortable. And you might want a pillow between your knees. Your baby is placed on their side, on the mattress. And you might want to start them with just a little bit lower than your nipple so that they can lift up to latch on. The mom uses the arm opposite the breast to bring her, her nipple up into the baby's mouth to help them latch, supporting the baby with her other arm. And this little baby's pretty sleepy, but we'll see if we can get him to come on. There you go, buddy. There it is. There you go. There you go. Perfect. And he's on. And many moms just fall asleep and get a really nice nap, which is perfect, because new moms are always looking for a little opportunity to do that. So that's my favorite sleep tips, and I still love to have the pillow between my legs. But I, I would breastfeed my kids until they were toddlers like that. And I got a lot of sleep. Uh, so guys, thank you so much for being here with us today. I would like to see if you have any closing tips or if you think there's a top topic we haven't covered. Jill, why don't I start with you? Okay, so for closing tips, um, my biggest tip to parents is to know yourself and to be honest with yourself when it comes to sleep teaching. Because if you're doing something because you're pressured into it or you feel like it's the right thing to do, but your heart and soul are not into it, you're feeling like you're doing something that's not okay for your baby, it's not going to work anyway. So you're never stuck. You can always make different decisions as your baby grows and as you are really ready. So know yourself and you know, work with where you're at in this process. Um, listen to your inner voice. So that would be my biggest tip. As far as, uh, we didn't talk that much about toddlers and preschoolers, so maybe there'd be another there topic be another, for that. Another show. Okay. Yes. Another show. Uh, and, and Jill, I know you teach incredible classes at the pump station here in LA, but uh, how can we reach you? Pumpstation.com, um, our website, we have all our great services. We're a parenting resource and boutique, and we offer all sorts of uh, classes for new parents, so you can find me there. Thank you. And Heidi, uh, do you have any closer re remarks? Oh, well, my most important uh, closing tip is actually very close to the one Jill just gave. Um, but it's really, really important that if a parent, um, so as Jill said, of course, you need to do uh, what feels right to you and uh, not what others try and tell you to do. But there's another thing coming into that as well is that uh, many parents often get judged for the way they um, help their baby sleep or, or whatever uh, part of parenting that is. And as a young or um, a recent mom, it it can really get you down, even if you know in your heart, okay, I don't have to be told by someone else how to do this. You're in this um, 
rather vulnerable state emotionally and um, a lot of resources out there and even well-meaning friends and family members will have some kind of judgment about what you do so my tip is don't let yourself um, be brought down by that i love that don't judge because there is also left yeah. right and center and there's not one way to parent yeah, that, that's, right. that's the thing. And, um, don't so do not feel judged. Yeah. And, and to all other people out there, do not judge yes. a parent. Just try and support and help and empower them. So uh, where can they reach you, Heidi? Uh, babysleepadvice.com And Nicole, do you have any closing advice for us? Yes, I would say one of the number one tips is to have appropriate expectations. You know, a lot of people think they're going to get their baby to sleep through the night and that, you know, you'll live happily ever after. And it's just not that way. Babies will need us where, you know, that's what we're here for. And it takes many years for them to be fully independent 100% of the time. And so just to have appropriate expectations for your baby and you know your baby best. And a lot of new moms don't have that confidence and they don't have a village of their, their own. So that's what we try to do is be an extension of your village. And we're here to support you, not, not judge you, like Heidi said. And I think just knowing that it, your baby will grow and mature and eventually they will sleep better with your persistence and your love and compassion. I love that. Um you know, you always know your your child best. That's a good one to remember. Yes, definitely. And your website? Babysleepsite.com. And you can also email me at Nicole at Babysleepsite.com. Thank you so much for taking the time to uh, be with us here today and for helping all these parents. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. Thank you for having us. My name is Bob Hamilton. I'm a pediatrician. I've been doing it now for about 30 years. One of the great uh, joys I've had in life is I've been able to care for literally thousands of newborn children. One of the challenges that pediatricians have in taking care of children is trying to communicate clear and precise information to their parents. A lot of times over a baby who's crying very, very loud. And I have uh, utilized a technique that I call the hold over the years, which is very helpful in calming children and keeping them quiet. So today I'd like to show you how I do that. It's a simple hold. I think you'll understand. Come with me now into one of my consultation rooms. I'll show you how I do it. Here we have a, a crying baby and he just got a shot here. So this is Ashton and here's what we do. So we pick up Ashton. I fold his right arm like this and then his left arm in front and then very gently hold his arms like this. Hold his little bottom and gently rock him up and down, just like that. And even though he just got a shot, look at that leg, that, that's a big ouch on that leg there. You can see that you can comfort him and quiet him. Again, I'm holding with my right hand his little bottom. I'm gently shaking him back and forth. We rock him up and down very gently. Sometimes we stir him to the left and we stir him to the right. And <laughs> there's our baby. And now I'd like to welcome esteemed pediatrician, Bob Hamilton. So great to have you here. Thank you, Leanna. Pleasure to be here. I'd like to start by just asking you, what is your philosophy on sleep? What do you say to your parents when they come in and say, my baby won't sleep? Between zero and five months, you're beginning to try to, you know, get them awake longer during the day. And by that time, you really can. You really can. And nighttime, you're, you know, you're hopefully they're going... By five months, look, a lot of children at five months of age will sleep four or five, even six hours on their own, nighttime. But the real key at five months of age, I tell mothers, is that you need to get your child to go to bed awake. And what I mean by that is you go through your whole nighttime routine. You, you uh, bathe them, you feed them, you change them, you sing to them, you pray with them, you do the whole, you know, the whole ritual, if you will, of the evening. And you also turn the lights down, you turn off your hip hop music and your, and your you know, electronic dance music or whatever you're playing, just like, you know, keeping that kid jarred and, and, <laughs> and awake. And you turn it all down, you turn the lights down and you have that wonderful tender moment with your baby. You know what I'm talking about? Yes, of course. Absolutely. 
And, and then when they're older, maybe read a book. Read a book. Yeah. You can actually read a book when they're young too. Yeah. Even uh, I'm a big believer in books and it's a different topic, I know, but I actually like the idea of actually reading to children, the, the rhythm of your voice, the, the sound of your voice. They've heard it their entire life, even in utero, they heard you speaking. So that is common to a baby. Singing, you sing to your baby, yeah, yeah. you know, and uh, a little lullaby, you know, something kind and sweet. You've done all that, and but before they actually fall, you know, dead asleep in your arms, which they will do that, you have to put them into their crib or into their bassinet. And, you, and they have to be, the word I use, the operative word, is cognizant, okay? That simply means that they are aware of the fact that they're, go, they're going they go to, to bed. bed. So they fall asleep on their own. They do. Yeah. They do. They have to learn. Now, I will tell you, uh, Leanna, that they're going to fight you. You know, you're going to put them in the bed and, or in the crib or wherever. And, the, and a kid can be in their own room at that point, if you want to know the truth. A lot of people don't do that. But wherever they are, they need to be in that room alone at that point in time. In other words, I think you, you put the baby down, you depart the room. It may be your bedroom, but you go out in the living room or whatever. You understand. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, they're going to cry. They're going to cry. And I let a, a five-month-old baby cry for three minutes, maybe five minutes. Short time. You go back into them. And I, I happen to be, you know, some people say, never pick your baby up. Don't, you know, just pat them or whatever. I, I think that that is kind of anti-natural for a mother. A mother, you guys, look, you're a mother. You tell me. Do you love your children? Yes. Did you, course, yeah, did yeah. you adore your five-month-old child? I did. Did you Such want to? Such a great time. It's off the smell. Even so, today, yeah. even today, it brings up those yes. wonderful feelings. It's natural for a mother to want to pick up their baby. So I tell my, my moms, I know other people would disagree. That's fine. I say, pick up your baby. Hold your baby, comfort them, calm them down again. And it may take a while. You know, it may take another five or ten minutes to kind of bring them to that quiet state again where you can then, again, before they fall asleep in your arms, okay, you again put them into the crib. Again, they are cognizant. They're not like ready alert, but they're aware of the fact that they're going to bed. They may cry again. I let them cry three to five minutes three times in a row, three to five, three to five, three to five. Then I extend it to seven to 10, okay? Same evening, okay? Where we're training now, okay? Do that three times in a row. Then I go 12 to 15 thereafter. And before you do embark on this, you and your husband uh, need to be- Ready. You need to have a plan. Yeah. You need to look at your calendar, a Thursday, a Friday, a Saturday, a Sunday, four or five days in a row where you have agreed, you've shaken on it, okay? You've, you've <laughs> agreed to, to go through the pain. It's painful. You let them cry. Night number one may be a nightmare. I'm telling you, they may cry three to five, three to five, three to five, seven to ten. You may, this may take a good hour, hour and a half to really kind of eventually have them Calm fall down. asleep. Night number two, it'll be half of that. Night number three, it'll be half of that. By four to five days, look, children are very bright. They figure it out very quickly. And if you tell them, you know what, honey, we love you with all of our heart, but we're going to teach you how to go to sleep. You know what? They figure it out. And they eventually, you'll find that over time, and I have many, many parents in my practice, Leanna, I really do, who, what they do is they, they teach their children how to go to sleep, and they become wonderful sleepers. They yeah, you know, they may go, yeah, they may cry for one minute, 30 seconds. Boom, they're out. They're, they're, they're good. They make it through the night. And I'll tell you, you as a mother, the father, everybody, they're all, everybody's happier. Yeah. We are actually uh, going to let you answer some questions for sure. some parents. Absolutely. So here we go. My question is, um, how do you get the baby to fall back asleep? after they wake up in the middle of the night? <laughs> well, that's a very good question. Let's see what uh, <laughs> Dr. Hamilton said. Well, that, that is a good question. And, uh, you know, in the middle of the night, okay, so you, you've conquered at five months of age. You've employed the a little discipline here, if you will, a little bit of uh, training, and you, you're now beginning to get them to at least go to sleep on their own. 
at uh, when they, but now, of course, they can wake up in the night. You can let them, they'll fall asleep, but then, you know, three hours later, they wake up. What do you do? Well, here's what I do. Uh, typically, if they're not being fed solid food, I go comfort them. I would go in there to them. I would have the mother, if she's breastfeeding, breastfeed them, change the diaper, comfort them. Again, I believe that you should put them down again in the middle of the night awake. And again, you can begin to employ the three to five minute type of rule. The same thing you did in the beginning, you do in the middle of the night. Now, that is, uh, if that, you have to, but you have to feed a child, okay? Later on, when children are on solid foods, you can essentially go in and not feed them and jerk, maybe change a diaper, but you, you don't feed them uh, and you encourage, you'll, you so just the, let them cry again. that's six months, right? Just yeah. So that's correct. That they, they start to, I remember. You're, you're good. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> okay, we have one more question for you. My question for the sleep expert would be for nap, um, because at 10 months, he, he just decided, I don't want to take a nap anymore. And he will do it for my mother-in-law or so, other people, but he won't do it for me anymore. I used to be able to get him to do it, and now he won't. Um, I kind of make him, I kind of have been recently, I don't know if that's okay, but I kind of, sometimes I try for 10 minutes, and then if he won't, I just, we just skip it in the morning lately. So I don't know if he's too young for that. He seems a little young to me. So uh, I kind of wondered if I should be doing that. If is that healthy or if not, like making him is not working <laughs> um, for me. Um, and then the other question is, is um, I do make him stay just for my sanity. I make him stay in his crib for two hours for the afternoon nap. Um, and sometimes he takes it and sometimes he doesn't. So I kind of in general, wondered their thoughts about that, if they have any tips on that. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, so it's a comp compound question. By the way, that was a very good question. And I, my, my general feeling about napping is, I don't, if, they're, if they're doing well at night, like making it through the night, sleeping you know, 8, 10, 12 hours a night, I don't really worry too much about napping. There are children who take routine, they're, they're regimented. They just you know, self-regulate themselves. Take a morning nap, an afternoon nap. They take an hour and a half, two-hour nap. They're wonderful. Uh, other kids are real erratic. And it, to a degree, it depends on the family, too. I mean, when you have multiple children, you find that you're schlepping children. You're, you're going here, you're going there. You're driving your virtual taxi cab driver, these poor moms. And that requires children becoming a little more malleable in terms of that need to be always regimented for that time. My, my daughter is a pediatrician, too, Dr. Noel Salyer. And, oh, that's so, that's so nice. Yeah, do you we, practice together? We do practice together. Oh, that's together. so good. It's a, it's a great joy. And Noel has been very good with the children. She actually has a kind of a, a, a rest time, okay? So she does exactly as our uh, woman with the question does. She actually puts her child into a crib in the afternoon for an hour or two, and they rest. Whether If they sleep or not, their doesn't call matter. Yeah. doesn't matter, but they at least have that time and to be at peace and in, in, in kind of in a restful kind of environment. Lights down, curtains closed, and everything. But I don't think that napping is napping's real variable, and you'll find that there are some children who really do not nap. Um, I can tell you that we've had our own children who did not nap, and you know there's no shot, there's no pill. There's no immunization or therapy I can send that child to or give to that child to make them nap. And there's no right or wrong. No right and wrong. No right or wrong. Really, no. So I hope that was helpful to you. Thank you so much for being here today and helping our parents and pleasure. hearing your sleep philosophy. So interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Thank very you very much. My mission with kids in the house has always been to try to present left, right, and center to give you different perspectives so that you as a parent can figure out what's right for you. We just saw Bob Hamilton talk about sleep training. Now I'd like to show you an expert who don't believe in sleep training. This, this is a dreadful idea. 
of allowing the kids to cry themselves to sleep. This, this was completely uninformed, uh, this idea and this advice by what children truly need and how, developmental, uh, how development works. Uh, when, when children cry, whether it's distress or tears of futility or upset, they need to cry in the comfort of those uh, who are responsible for them. Uh, the fact is, is it can produce sleep, just like it does it in the neonate nursery, uh, in the hospital, but that's because of defendedness. Uh, the most difficult thing for a child to face is separation. And when we say, okay, I'm not going to talk to you anymore, I'm closing the door, that's it. Uh, we push a child's face into separation and, uh, and it alarms them and it can call forth defendedness that can actually put them to sleep out of defense. Uh, but this is not a place where children need to go to sleep from. They need to go to sleep from a place where they relax, uh, where, where all is well, uh, just like we do. And there's two things that are most important here in, in terms of sleep. And if you get sleep right as a parent, it's a prototype of all kinds of other experiences. Uh, there's two things that are most significant. One, you want to create a continuity of, of connection. Uh, you, you want to be able to, um, to answer their needs to be in contact with you at all times. So if they can't see you, uh, then maybe they can hear you. Uh, if they can't hear you, maybe they can smell you and you can put your nightie around them or, or, or next to them. In some way, they need to have that sense of contact. The ultimate answer, developmentally, is that their, their attachment grows deeper so that they can hold on to you when physically apart. They're connected at the heart. They're connected through sameness. This is the ultimate answer, so we need to be patient. Children will grow out of this. And the other thing is, is that we mustn't put their uh, eyes and their attention on separation. We must put their eyes on the next connection. And this is the key to all sleep issues. And so you always put the connection on the next point of contact. I'll see you in my dreams. If children can't handle even the tiniest little bit, we get the egg timer out. Before the egg timer is, is out, mommy will be back, daddy will be back, I have another hug in me for you. Uh, but it's always putting the focus on the connection and the next connection that's coming. Uh, gradually the child can do this by looking forward to getting up in the morning with you. Uh, you know, I've got a special treat planned. Uh, or if you do say, I'll see you in my dreams, make sure when they ask you in the morning that you have a wonderful dream to tell them of connection and so on. But soon when a child gets used to the fact that sleep means that they're going into connection, uh, they can hardly wait to go to sleep. It gets better when they go to sleep rather than worse. But if you can solve this problem, a sleep problem, you're, you're set up to solve all kinds of problems in childhood because the key is you put their focus on the next connection. You bridge the separation rather than put their, their attention into separation. Sleep. It's one of those topics that many parenting experts don't agree on. The next segment features three well-renowned celebrity pediatricians in a heated discussion about where your baby should sleep. Babies should not sleep alone. The safest baby is a breastfeeding baby in the family bed. And we're at odds with an awful lot of popular literature and, and public health departments who absolutely know nothing at all. The safest baby is a breastfeeding baby in the family bed. Some of us may take some exception to that comment. <laughs> Where would you have a baby sleep? I would have a baby sleep right next to the mother in a co-sleeper or in a bassinet. Um, so the mother has an easy opportunity to breastfeed. It's safer for babies being in the room with the parents as opposed to being in a different room. Well, first is that our culture sets us up to see babies as adversaries in terms of their sleep, you know, winning baby sleep battles. I mean, the whole orientation needs to be redone, as is in some ways the commentary that my new, my colleagues and friends, Dr. Karp and Dr. Altman said. I don't blame them for that kind of rhetoric because I think there's very few people that have actually studied this issue in detail, and this is what I've spent 30 years of my life doing. What concerns me, I would say two things. One is, at least the statistics are, about 70% of the babies who die in their sleep in the first year of life die in an adult bed. There is, in my opinion, no science of bed sharing research from the American Academy of Pediatrics. It's so driven by ideology. You know, we have a bias in the questions asked, the choice of an, the analysis. 
but I do believe science has a way of correcting itself. 50% of parents are sleeping less than six hours a night. And when you do that week after week, and you did it at the end of pregnancy, you are the equivalent of drunk. That's why you get in car accidents when you're exhausted. That's why you forget things on the roof of your car, you know. It, it, you, you, your brain is impaired. And then when you fall asleep, you sleep deeply. And you are the last person who can make a good appraisal of how exhausted you are. And so for those reasons, going to bed sleep uh, deprived, which so many parents do, even though you're loving and you're breastfeeding, you are not aware of what you're going. You're the equivalent of a drunk parent. I agree with Harvey. I, that's what I was going to say is that I don't trust myself because I am exhausted. And so I have this bassinet that kind of flips onto my bed. It really helps me have my son close to me so I can nurse him, I can bond him, bond with him, I can cuddle with him. But when it's time for me to go to sleep, I really have to put him down because I, I'm a restless sleeper and I just don't trust myself and I want him to be in the safest environment possible. And what we've seen is the longer that the mother has actually slept with her baby, not it is that she gets habituated, that she becomes increasingly more sensitive such that 60% of her arousals are explained by her baby having aroused plus or minus two seconds before. I have such a stringent objection to a baby being in a separate room or being some distance from his or her parents mm -hmm. that I really prefer the family bed. Uh, I actually, I, I, I trust Dr. Altman not to, to roll over and, and squash the baby. Babies are inherent contact seekers. You can have co-sleepers. I promote co-sleepers. I think it's fantastic. The problem is that the babies don't want to stay in them. They want <laughs> to get as close to their parent as they possibly can because that's what their survival depends on. Yes, mothers are tired. Most of them sleep with their babies specifically because they become less tired, because they get more sleep and so do their babies. There is a reason for this. And so these easy rhetorical strategies are very, very inappropriate. But the more response you give, the more you build a foundation of love and warmth and trust so that when you do need to use it, when you do need to set limits for your 9 or 12 or 20 month old, you're basing it on this, this very high level of communication mm -hmm. and understanding. And it's, it's, a, it's hard work. And the very best selling books often don't do that. They do tell you to let the baby cry, wow. which uh, isn't, again, is not the best way to, to wrap your life around your baby. We're too used to having 100 to 200 years of thinking that the question should always be, is it safe to sleep with your baby, as opposed to what it always should have been, is it safe not to? Thank you so much for being with us today. Please let us know what topics you want us to cover and any problems you might have that you want us to help you with. Thanks for tuning in and over now from Kids in the House.